Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, you were probably expecting uh, the New Future Center CEO, Ellen Moyer, and instead you got me, so lucky you. Uh, but I was happy. I just live across the lake in Madison to be able to be here, and I'm excited to share with you some of, some of our thinking at New Teacher Center about how to, uh, how to best support new educators uh, in the classroom. First, just a really a little bit about New Teacher Center. Um, we are a, uh, a national nonprofit practice-based organization. Uh, based in Santa Cruz, California, although our reach and extension goes, uh, goes around the country. We have some regional offices in various places. And our, our mission is really focused on accelerating the development of early career educators once they arrive in the classroom. So in many ways, I think my presentation will be somewhat of an extension. I think the flow of the, this presentation probably made sense in terms of really learning and thinking about how teachers learn initially and then how they move into continuing to learn professionally um, on the job. Um, our work at the New Teacher Center is primarily program-based. We design and operate uh, induction programs for new teachers around the country, although we do also have a focus on school leadership, uh, assessment of teaching and learning or working conditions, uh, as well as a policy work. And I'm director of policy for New Teacher Center, and I head up our, our public policy focus, which is not about necessarily extending our organizational work but trying to kind of raise the expectation for the types of supports through mentoring and other supports that new teachers get uh, in an on-the-job setting in schools. Um, our history dates back to uh, work in California in the 1980s, originally housed at the University of California, and uh, then several years ago we split off as an independent nonprofit, and we've continued to grow our work uh, nationwide and in some cases internationally. Uh, I think one of our proudest achievements was having the highest ranked I3 uh, grant application awarded by the, by the federal government recently, and we've also been partnering with a number of race to the top states and have extended our work in some form uh, in 40 states across the country. Um, this, this past year, we've reached uh, nearly 7,000 teacher mentors across the country, uh, nearly 26,000 beginning teachers, and according to our calculations, touched well over a million students in terms of uh, helping uh, helping uh, their teachers extend and deepen their practice in the classroom. Um, so why focus on new teachers? I mean, why is this a topic here at EWA, and why should we think about beginning teachers as a uh, specific uh, class, class of teachers? Well, I think there's a few reasons. I think, one, there's uh, some real demographic challenge uh, going on uh, where you have, uh, you have an aging cadre of baby boom teachers, particularly in this part of the country, uh, aging out or beginning to age out of the profession. Um, some of the great work uh, and research that Richard Ingersoll at the University of Pennsylvania has done has really chronicled both the simultaneous growing and uh, greening of the teaching profession. We found uh, several years ago, just before the recession, that the, the modal or typical uh, teacher in America's classrooms had become a first-year teacher, which was, uh, which was a vast departure from two decades earlier when the typical uh, or average teacher had about 16 or 17 years of experience under, uh, under his or her, her belt. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a concern. Um, new teachers are much more prevalent in America's classroom. And we also know that the learning curve of beginning teachers I is real. Um, just, as, just as students are expected to be lifelong learners, we also, we also should expect and hopefully do expect our teachers to be lifelong learners. And, I think when, when new teachers are struggling to uh, apply and contextualize uh, knowledge and skills they've learned during their pre-service development, uh, there, is a, there is a learning curve inherent in that. And I think one can appropriately ask the question of whether we should expect a first-year teacher to do the same job as a veteran teacher, and I think that's a, that's a good question to ask. But given that that appears, that appears to be the expectation we make of new teachers, uh, we need to do a far better job of giving them that contextual uh, support um, on the jobs than we do typically in America's classrooms today. There's also, a, there's also some added concern um, of the way we sort of structure our educational system that really fuels a cycle of, of inequity that exists. We know that new teachers tend to get placed in the toughest assignments, the toughest classrooms, and the toughest schools. Uh, we know that in part as a result Turnover is exacerbated in those systems, and uh, the end result is that the hardest to reach students are the least likely to get the most, the most experienced uh, and, more, and more veteran and more effective teachers. And that's a, uh, that's a real concern 
I think just as a, as a touch point, I would encourage uh, you to take a look at a report that was released by the Alliance for Excellent Education over this summer. Uh, we collaborated with them on this report called uh, The Path to Equity, Improving the Effectiveness of Beginning Teachers. Talks a little bit more about our work and a little bit more about, the, about these problems that are, uh, that are inherent today. We know that, uh, that teachers that are developed um, oftentimes don't stick around uh, we, they don't stick around for us to see the fruits of their labor, and, and that's true. The data bear that out. 40% uh, or more of teachers are leaving the profession within the first five years. Um, if you ask the question why, and you should, uh, teachers will tell you uh, it's not so much about compensation or salary, but it's really about the structural realities that they face in their classroom and schools every day, the lack of administrative support, the lack of a supportive principal, uh, lack of ability or opportunities to collaborate with colleagues, uh, few really strong and individualized opportunities to learn and grow on the job. Uh, we as an organization uh, have an initiative called the Teaching and Learning Conditions Initiative. Um, the centerpiece of that initiative is, uh, is our TELL survey. TELL stands for Teaching, Empowering, Leading, and Learning. Uh, we've, uh, through that survey, we've collected the voices of more than 1.2 million educators over the last several years. Um, it's generally uh, given at the state level, although we work with some districts as well. Just from looking over the attendee list, I know uh, the states of Colorado, Indiana, and Tennessee are some examples of states where we have fielded that survey and broken down the data. We ask a, a, a sort of a panoply of questions around, uh, around um, support, and professional development, and resources, and leadership. Uh, and a lot of that plays out in some briefs we put together around it. So that's another resource to maybe look at as you're thinking about how some of those contextual factors uh, shape teachers' perceptions of their working conditions and, and lead to uh, lead certainly some teachers uh, in the less supportive environment to, to leave that school or leave the profession entirely. Um, I think one of the problems when we talk about teacher induction is there's not really a common shared definition of what that means. And I think just as a, a real uh, quick example, I think there's a, there's a lack of distinction oftentimes made between induction and mentoring, for one. Um, we, as an organization, see mentoring as a, a critical uh, component of an induction system, but it's not where it ends. Uh, an induction system uh, needs to extend just beyond high-quality mentoring to, con to consist of other supports, including really su supportive school leadership and really system, uh, uh, an induction system that's systematized within a school and district community uh, that's made as part of, a, be a part of a system of lifelong learning that begins in pre-service and extends through the profession. Um, another, another, I think, real, real problem is the policy requirements and mandates around this are generally pretty tepid. Um, we've chronicled some of this in our review of state policy on teacher induction that's available on our website. And uh, you know, it, it, it basically paints um, a pretty, a pretty um, tepid picture of state policy. Um, our, our report really showed that only 11 states of our 50 require um, a multi-year course of support extending into the second year of, of teaching. And one of the uh, things that comes out of research really shows that a multi-year system of support is really, really critical. One year may well not uh, result in the types of impacts on teacher retention or student learning that we want yet uh, the, the typical state does not require uh, a two-year course of support. Um, and then finally, only three states, and I'll call them out because it's, it's a quick list, uh, Connecticut, Delaware, and Iowa are the only three that require a multi-year system of teacher induction uh, as a requirement uh, for the certification or licensure process and provide some dedicated funding for that, sort of recognizing that teacher quality is not just a local concern, but it really is, uh, really is a statewide concern as well. Our, uh, our approach to teacher induction, and this is a slide that uh, I'm not used to delivering. It's, it, this is my CEO's slide, so I'm trying my, trying my best to be pithy and quick and, uh, and illustrative in my, uh, in my description. But we really argue that an induction program can't just be a standalone, but it really needs to be built um, within, within a system. It needs to be part of a system of support. Uh, where all stakeholders are engaged in a common vision of the purpose of induction, which is not a palliative, which is not about emotional support, which is not about psychosocial support, but is about instructional improvement. How can we personalize, um, and, and I, I, was, I was struck by the discussion uh, by the prior presenters about the use of protocols and inquiry cycles and tools, and that's really what's needed. 
I mean, if you go on the ground, you see how induction and mentoring plays out. It's usually very uh, unstructured. It's usually, there's not time provided for it. There's not training provided for it. It's an add-on. And uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't get to the deep level of conversations about, about instructional practices and classroom uh, challenges that it, that it needs to. And that, um, that leads to my, my next slide, which is, th this is sort of what we see as the real, real critical quality components uh, of an induction program. We approach the work from, I think what someone else said, a growth mindset. Um, I think some of, our, some of our education policy discussion today is, is very much caught up or focused and framed around a deficit mindset of teachers. We're really focused on a growth mindset. How can we build the capacity of high quality mentors to be brokers of services and brokers of conversations to help new teachers improve on the job, recognize what they're doing well, and recognize where their struggles are, and connect them with the type of insistence that's going to help them uh, sort, sort through those. One of the critical pieces of induction is that, is that it's continuous. It's, it's unlike um, an evaluation process, which is maybe point in time oriented. We, our expectation in providing time for both mentors and new teachers to meet regularly, weekly and intensively, is to, is to, is to basically host a continuous conversation about, about classroom practice. And, and focus that support and learning in a formative way. We, I mean, it's, it's decoupled in some ways from, uh, from any type of job evaluation, although we, we very much argue that um, a, a, an induction system of support for new teachers needs to be housed alongside and aligned with other forms of evaluation and assistance. And, uh, and that, in fact, is how it plays out on the ground in, in many places. I mentioned uh, multi-year, time is really, really critical. Um, the way we, the way we uh, operationalize our programs on the ground is in many cases we utilize full-time teacher mentors. So if you see sort of how mentoring and induction plays out typically, you're dealing with full-time teaching loads uh, that both the new teacher and the mentor have, and they're expected to then develop this support structure on top of a full-time teaching load. So what we do is we, uh, we work with districts that seek to give a veteran effective teachers a uh, full release from all classroom teaching duties. So their entire full-time job is mentoring and supporting beginning teachers. And, uh, and we find that that enables us to really provide a sufficient and regular amount of time to really hone in on those new teachers' practices. And, and really, it, it plays out in terms of what the research says, is that the, uh, the mentoring time needs to be regularized and of sufficient uh, duration and quantity to really um, achieve the types of impacts we're looking for fundamentally on the ability of teachers to effectively deliver instruction and, uh, and, um, and, and impact student learning. Um, I mean, a couple research points. There's a lot out there that you can read, and there's some really good summaries of the research around induction. I mean, I think our feeling is that it's, it's uh, pretty robust. I think there's, there's more to come. Uh, we as an organization are involved in two real high-scale uh, federal evaluations as both as part of our I-3 grant and our SEED grant, and we're hopeful that there will be some uh, better compelling data about our specific uh, model and approach to the work. But, um, but I think, uh, you know, teachers that experience intensive forms of induction uh, describe it as the best professional development they've ever received. Um, we've seen over decades in California that it's actually really fueled pipelines into school leadership, uh, both uh, formally in an administrative sense, but also within the teaching population within schools and districts as well. So it really is a, it, it's almost like a leadership uh, training and kind of in, 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 enculturating uh, a tool as well within, within schools. Um, so I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave the research to speak for itself just in the interests of time. Just as a, a final note, um, just a, as a few story ideas that I've been able to sort of come up with for you all. I, was, I thought there was a really great piece written uh, in uh, Chalkbeat, Colorado. So a shout out to Chalkbeat by Kate Schimmel. Uh, I think that was a story, I think they came out in late August where she followed a new teacher. And I think that's a really compelling way to, you know, kind of paint an individual picture of, 
of the challenges that a new teacher faces uh, in their first year in the classroom. And I think that's a, you know, that, that just, it's, a, it's a way to put a human face, I think, on this story, which is, I think, a pretty compelling idea to think about following a teacher locally. Um, I think another real interesting angle to potentially think about is, you know, we're not making an argument that there need to be uh, more resources, but I think the reality is is that there's a lot of resources in the bucket right now around teacher development. I mean, the two plus billion dollars in Title II funds that come down from the federal level. How are those dollars being used by dis you know by districts in your in your regions? Uh, and what does what what does that look like? Are they standalone workshops? Um, what type of development or learning opportunities are uh, beginning teachers and other teachers being given in your districts to really individualize their learning and focus on their strengths and needs. And then I think finally, um, you know, I think there's some compelling policy stories too, particularly as, you know, we track uh, developments uh, in the teacher evaluation space or the common core space, uh, what type of supports are uh, in place for beginning teachers or struggling teachers or for that matter, uh, teacher evaluators. Um, are we training uh, evaluators and, and others, uh, coaches and mentors, um, to really be adept at providing actionable feedback on teaching? It needs, it need to ex needs to extend beyond just observational uh, protocols, but really needs to get down to the level of individualizing feedback that, uh, that educators themselves find uh, helpful. And I think I will stop there. Um, that's not my contact information, but if you reach out to Ellen or email me at lgoldrick at the same uh, domain, you can find me. So thanks for the opportunity.